Okay, well, uh, so this is Dr. Morton, and uh, this is the um, the first recorded or the first video for Micro Two. Although I did do the live Zoom le lecture last week or the live Zoom time, mostly to kind of pick everybody's brains and kind of see what they were thinking. Okay, so I will do a lecture every week. I, uh, like I said, I will try and get it posted by noon on Tuesday. Um, and I might miss that, but I'll for sure guarantee it'll be done by five. But uh, most of the time it should be uh, ready to go by noon. I'll generally make it an hour long, but uh, some of my 10 might go uh, hour 15 or even an hour 30 max. Um, so uh, so I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we're going to have a good time this semester. Uh, I'm a little bit sad that we're still doing COVID, and it does drive me crazy. Um, but I do like Micro 2, partly because uh, I usually have mostly seniors, and uh, just the maturity level of the students in the class is, is greater, and so it makes the class run a little smoother. And it also, it's an advanced class, so, um, so the students know more, and, uh, and, it's, and we can do a few more things, and I think that's really good. So I, I'd like you to approach this class with the philosophy that, um, that you're taking it because this is what you're interested in doing for a good part of your life. And, uh, and I, I'd like you to just, uh, you know, kind of own this for yourself um, because what you get out of it is going to be what you put into it. Uh, you know, I wish I had a way to force feed knowledge, but I don't. Uh, all we can do is give you the opportunities to learn and hopefully provide some motivation. But in the end, you've got to do the work. And, uh, and hopefully it's work that, in this case, you enjoy because it's in an area that you're really interested in. So I think if you approach it that way, I think, I think you'll have a really good time. We're, what, what I'm sort of big picture, we're going to try and learn about the, the, uh, the KL25Z uh, Freedom Board, which has a KL25Z Kinetis VLK128 uh, uh, it's, sorry, it's a KL25Z 128 VLK4. Uh, the VLK has to do with package type and how many pins and things like that. Um, it is a low profile quad flat pack. Uh, it's got 20 pins on each of its four edges uh, and it's a square. And uh, they mount it uh, sort of dag uh, at, uh, on the bias on the board. They mounted it at 45 degrees to the board edges. Uh, <clears throat> I guess uh, probably because it looks cool, <laughs> but also because uh, uh, it makes it a little bit easier to uh, get traces from two sides moving in the same direction on the board, uh, as opposed to really just one side and then the other side has to go out and make a right angle. So uh, there is some logic to it, uh, <clears throat> and uh, and you can see that. Maybe I'll maybe I'll fire that up here real quick. Let's see if I no, it's not plugged in. Uh, let me pause this while I get this set up for just a second. Okay, so here's the uh, the Freedom Board with the KL25Z128 uh, VLK4 chip on it. So, uh, interestingly, let me get a little pointer here. So, of course, here's the main chip, and you can see it's mounted on the bias. But notice there's this other chip mounted on the bias, too. And believe it or not, that's an that's an M, that's a KL, that, that's a, this has an M0 plus processor in it. This is an M4. It's another Kinetis chip. This chip runs the OpenSDA interface, which allows this board to talk to the integrated development environment. So basically, its, it's programmer debugger has been incorporated onto the board, uh, and it's run by this additional chip that is actually slightly more powerful than this chip, but of course, it doesn't have so many pins. Um, and uh, then there's some other features on the chip. There's a really nice uh, RGB LED, wh which I wish I could get my hands on for Micro One. I would use it in a heartbeat because it's it's really pretty cool because it uh, all the colors uh, are very uh, you can't see the individual LEDs in it. They're sort of there's a lens that combines them, so that makes that allows you to when you blend the colors, it, they really do look good. Um, and then there's a, 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 a external crystal oscillator here. Uh, that is used to uh, power the, the oscillator section so that it's very, very stable. Um, the chip does have 
all sorts of built-in oscillator capability, but with the external oscillator, they can generate a bunch of different frequencies and even higher frequencies than the oscillator itself. Then there's a single LED here, and that LED, uh, when you plug it into the integrated development environment or, or to your d desktop computer, that LED should be on solid and not blinking. And if it's blinking, it means you have a problem with the firmware on the board. Some of the old boards do have old firmware, which will not work with Windows 10. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, you can't fix it in Windows 10. Uh, you have to go back to, an, uh, I think, an XP machine to fix it. Maybe a Windows 7 will, I'm not sure, but for sure an XP will. Uh, <clears throat> and I keep one of my old XPs around just for that purpose. But I think we finally... Uh, finally don't have any any students with any of those boards left unless somebody gave you a hand-me-down board. The boards are fine. They're still identical. It's just the firmware. So all we have to do is flash your board with the new firmware and, and your board will work perfectly. But uh, you have to do that on a Windows XP uh, computer. So anyway, if, if, you, if your light's blinking, you have a problem. So get in touch with me and we'll fix your board. Um, worst case, we'll get you a new one. But you shouldn't have to have a new one. It should work fine. We just have to update the firmware. And, and you can sort that out. It's pretty easy to sort that out. All you have to do is, is, uh, is load the board up uh, by, uh, by plugging it. What you, can, what you can do is you can unplug the board, and then you push down the reset button, and you hold it down, and then you plug the board back in. Now, when you do this, notice that that light is now blinking. And notice that you can see that it said bootloader E. So this board now instantiates itself as a mass storage device in the USB system, and it shows up uh, just like a jump drive that you might have plugged in. And in fact, if you're using some of the uh, some other software packages, you can actually drop uh, bit files on it, which will then be automatically uploaded uh, from the uh, from the M4 processor running the OpenSDA port to your KL25Z M0 uh, chip and, and execute. Uh, and that's the way some people use this board. Uh, we won't do that. Uh, we're going to use it with an integrated development environment uh, because that's, as, an, as a practicing engineer, you're going to use, for the most part, integrated development environment. It's not sort of hobby level stuff. But, uh, but anyway, you can do that. And if, we, uh, if I drop out of this and I bring up the, uh, the file system, Let's see if I can pop this over there. If I do this, I, you can see I have bootloader right here, and if I click on bootloader, we have this information. Now, uh, if I if I click on uh, SDA info htm, I do that, and what it does, it boots up the PNE Micro website and will show me. Uh, what firmware I have. Now, there's no reason for you to do this. I don't think any of you will have to do this. Uh, <clears throat> so my bootloader version is 1.11. And uh, so that's that's fine. That's all I need. If you have 1.09 or less, then you will have to update it. But as long as you have 1.0 1. Uh, and above, you should be fine. Uh, <clears throat> So, uh, but you can always check it if you're having problems. Uh, and if you hold the button down and plug it in and you cannot, and it won't instantiate, then that's a big problem. Now, if you do want to update it, then you have to go through some steps. I'm not going to go, go through those here. You do have to create an account and then download some software and it comes zipped. So you have to unzip it twice uh, and eventually you can get to the driver you need. It's a little bit complicated, but anyway, uh, it's not that impossible. Now, normally you would have uh, a programmer debugger like this, this multi-link, and this is the, this is the device that PNE sells, and you could use that with this board, uh, but I don't know exactly how uh, the interface. You might have to uh, solder on some additional pins to get it to interface, but in any event, so that's how that works. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get rid of that. Um, well, okay, so <clears throat> let me go back to the camera. Okay, so anyway. Um, so I'm, but I'm going to take it out of this mode, and if I just plug it back in normally, uh, then it's fine. Now, because I didn't change anything. But if you screw around with it, then you can get it in some funny states that can be trip, 
a little bit tricky to get out of. So don't 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 put it in bootloader mode unless you are having problems with the board. Okay, um, what else? So on this board, there's also a uh, a temperature sensor. There's a uh, there's a voltage regulator. Uh, that's one right there. I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, think that's the. I think that is the regulator. Uh, and then um, there, there's also uh, a uh, an accelerometer. And the accelerometer is, and there are, all the parts are labeled on here. The accelerometer is right there. It's hard to see it on this, but it's that little chip right there. And you can see right above it. I think you can see. Right above it, it says uh, it says ACCEL. Uh, anyway, so so there are some other parts, and there are some other headers. Like there's a header here we didn't populate. There's some more pins here we haven't populated. There's a little three pin thing we haven't populated. There's another you know eight pin or little very tight spacing header we didn't populate. And some of those are would be used if you were using a PE PNE uh, micro uh, programmer debugger. But since it has its built-in debugger, we don't really need to do that. And that would just be additional expense. Here is a touch slider. And if you look at the tracing carefully, you can see how, how they have these, 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 uh, these, these two different pointed things. Looks like a, a backgammon board. And uh, anyway, as you move your finger from one side to the other, there are two touch channels involved. And the relative intensity of the touch varies between the two touch channels such that you can have some sense of where your finger is on this touch slider. Um, and it works okay. It's not super, super duper great. Um, and uh, we had one of our older labs uses that. I don't, I, so this, this term we have, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of this and I'm going to change the camera back to me. and put myself down there. And then I'm going to bring up the integrated development environment. So most of you hopefully have loaded up uh, the IDE, the MCU Expresso. And I'm going to bring it up and point out a couple things. And so while well, it comes up, uh, so one of the things it's going to do is ask for this workspace. and um, the way we've set it up, it always goes to the same workspace on the on uh, on the workstation. So we click this box in the in the image in the lab, and uh, use this uh, as a default and do not ask again. And so so it always goes to the same one. But if you want to use a jump drive, uh, you could theoretically put some of the demo programs on your jump drive and use it. But for some of the earlier labs, you, you might as well. Uh, you know, use the directory as it's set up, and I don't think you'll get this screen because we uh, on the lab computers because we clicked this box. I'm going to leave it on mine just because I might want to change the directory from time to time. All right. Um, so, so I believe that this integrated development environment has some uh, it is a little bit nicer than Code Warrior that we used to use. The reason we, we made I decided to make this change in January, kind of right before Christmas, was that uh, the the old IDE has gotten very difficult. Code Warrior it's hard it's hard to download it. It's not being supported. Uh, it's a little quirky now. It, it doesn't seem to work like it used to, um, and I just got so frustrated with it that I finally gave up. Now, when you load it up, you get some choices on uh, on what to uh, what to install uh, when you load the SDK for the Freedom Board. Now I uh, so down here it says import SDK examples. Uh, okay, uh, so if you click on this, you get this, and if you click on the Freedom Board here, then uh, it should bring up. Um, and I think because I've imported them all, it doesn't leave anything left. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, next. Yeah, so you get this screen. And uh, so there are these CMSIS driver examples, demo apps, driver examples. 
ISS decay examples, multiprocessor examples, RTOS examples, and USB examples. Okay, so let me explain. And I, at this point, I'm not planning on, uh, not planning on using any of these except for uh, the demo apps and the and the and the driver examples. Uh, we might use the CMSIS drivers and we might use the ISS DK examples. So if you want to check those first four, that's great. The multiprocessor, we don't have uh, we don't have multiprocessors involved. Uh, and the RTOS examples, that stands for real-time operating system. We probably will not use that. And then the USB examples, these are ones which, if you remember our, our video over here, um, if you, we look back at the board here briefly, Oops, I didn't change. Oops. Ah. Oh, crap. Okay, sorry. Um, I swear. I cannot get to it. It won't move. And I can't click the button at the bottom, so I don't know. This is bad. Uh, oh, man. Okay, here, close. There we go. All right. So, uh, so if you, so, there's two USB ports. What's this one over here for? So this this board and this chip have the capability to host to be a, a USB master, and so that's what this port is for. If you set some of that software up. You can actually plug things in over here and use them, um, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, so it's a very powerful chip, uh, and it even has on it uh, this voltage regulator, or maybe it's a built-in regulator in the chip, I forget, so that it can actually provide 5 volts as part of the master USB port here. So it, so it, 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 it pretty much fully implements a, uh, a USB 2.0 uh, port. Um, the USB 3.0 standard, of course, doesn't use this, this form factor for the plug. It uses the USB-C port, and the USB-C standard is extremely uh, uh, detailed and complicated, uh, and this chip won't support that, but, um, but it will do the USB 2.0. Uh, and that's what, these, uh, that's what these examples here are about. And, and you could actually play with those. Uh, you can just boot them up and run them. Um, so if you want to later on load that up and do that and we might even I might I might get around to playing with those too and maybe we'll actually do one of those for a lab I don't know I haven't really thought about it at this point okay um, so so the one other thing um, so so if we do uh, so in this case I I've already imported these so I'm I, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do anything else and then yeah so I'm just gonna cancel out of this when you actually run it, so let me so let me run through this. Uh, I was playing with the shell program, but I'm gonna I'm going to uh, close it. And I'll do the hello world instead. So I'm gonna open that project, which hopefully you guys have looked at already. So now it's now what it does, uh, it should bring that up. First, I'm gonna. So, a couple of things. The uh, when when it actually comes up, it comes up in 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 several different uh, modes. And uh, it, it generally, when you want to write code and get a program going, you you should be in this this one here, which is C C plus <clears throat> plus. And so when I do that, then it should change and it should show me. It should show me my program here, whatever I've uh, clicked on, and let's see. Uh, so that is, yeah. So that's something else. So I'm gonna get rid of that, and I'll go down here. I'll pull down um, the sources, and I'll click the Hello World C, and that'll that'll show the the software that I want to look at. Now you can also go down here in Doc, and there's always a README. You can click on that. And this talks about how, how it should work and, um, and what the program does and, and how you can use it. Now, it's 
uh, it's not perfect. This is a little sketchy on details, and there are even some things that are a little bit distracting, like it talks about having to set up set up a serial port and have these settings on it. Nope, you don't have to do that. It just automatically does that because it, it uses the same connection that the IDE is using. Um, and if you try and set up a separate uh, 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 a serial terminal with these settings, it doesn't work. At least I haven't gotten it to work yet. So, uh, so this is a little bit confusing. And um, so, so it's good to look at this and read through it, but to take a little bit of it with a grain of salt because uh, some features of it seem like they don't work quite, quite like they're described here. Um, so anyway. Uh, and this would probably be true if you're maybe if you were using one of the other debuggers. I, I don't know, but in any event, uh, with OpenSDA, it comes right through the OpenSDA port, and uh, and you don't have to. I know with our other integrated development environment, uh, the, the when you you could actually open up two ports, uh, and one port you could talk directly to the board through its UART. And the other port, you could go through the Open SDA connection, and they would they would show exactly the same things, and they would both work simultaneously. And you could have two terminal programs open, but connected to different ports, but talking through the same UART on the chip, uh, one through the uh, Open SDA connection and one directly. Kind of interesting, but that's how. But it did work that way. This one probably will work that way, but I haven't gotten it to do that yet, so I don't know. Um, so because I'm sort of new to this as well, I'm learning along with you. Uh, but what I will say is that so far I've been very, uh, very pleased with uh, how they set things up. So if you look at the Hello World program, and I tried to put this in the guide. Let me actually let me go ahead and switch this out here. Well, um, yeah, let me switch this out. All right, so I, I was really happy with this. Uh, so one of the things I'd like you to do, if you come over here, you can you can particularly like here where they, they they have these functions. So here's the init program. So if you just if you just hover over it like this, this comes up, and then you can you can actually expand it so that you can see everything like that. And oh yeah, I took it away. Hmm, how about that? Well, it is. So I don't. I don't think I can have both these on at the same time. So anyway, all right. You have to shrink mine down. So you can look at it, and and in this particular case, you can learn quite a bit. So I'm going to expand it again, and so I do really like to go through this, and I want you to just look at these. The idea in these labs is not to race through them and get them done and check it off. The idea is to learn. That's why you're here, and if you want to develop. Uh, deeper and greater skills with microprocessors there's just no other way around it you have to wade into the details and begin to understand how these things are really put together and done so this they give a little uh, in the in the in the comments up here they give a little description of the function and uh, configures pin routing and optional pin electrical features okay so first off the first thing that happens is it turns on the clock to the port Remember, um, I talked about this in Micro One. The in the, the KL25Z, you you always have to have um, the the clocks to most functions, including all of the GPIO ports and all the on chip modules. Pretty much can be turned off, or, or and by default are off. And in order to use any of these features on the chip, uh, you have to turn on the clock. Uh, so that you can then configure it and set things up. And actually, in some cases, once you've configured and set things up, you can turn the clock back off. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, most of the time you do need to leave it on, and that's generally what's done. But uh, So the first thing you do here is enable the clock to port A, because we're going to use port A. And then the first thing we're going to set up is the UART uh, transmit receive pin and the UART transmit pin. And if you remember in the data sheet, the uh, there's a multiplexer setting, and um, I'm not going to go to that now because that's going to be a little bit of distracting. But 
if you look at the if you look at the chapter on mux uh, and you scroll down a little bit you'll find a table for all the pins all 80 pins on the chip and all the multiplexer settings uh, there of course aren't any for the power and ground pins but uh, but other than that they all have them and there's there's a default setting which is always an analog function if there is one for the pin and then then uh, and that's uh, that's multiplexer setting zero multiplexer setting one is always the GPIO function setting and then the other settings two three four and whatnot are various things most of the pins have uh, have a couple of different things they can be but it's not like you can just pick any pin and have it be the UART receive pin and any pin be the UART transmit pin it won't work like that but you can scroll through the multiplexer uh, lit table of 80 pins and you can see which ones can be assigned uh, to the UART tra transmit and UART receive pin now the other thing you have to keep in mind here is that um, that that there are actually three different UARTs on this board and they didn't put UART 0 here which is a little surprising uh, but if you looked at, if you looked at uh, PTA 1 and PTA 2 you'll see on that multiplexer sheet that uh, it refers to UART 0 and there's a, at least one other place in the 80 pins where there's two pins that can also be used for UART 0 uh, there might even be a third place I can't remember but but the, so you're limited to one or maybe two different uh, two or maybe three choices for a lot of these pins a lot of them only two uh, and you so you do have to set up the UART setting uh, for the for this UART pin to be the transmit pin and in this case this line then uh, sets up uh, the the UART pin and it uh, And it sets it sets that that board uh, internal pins debug UART receive pin uh, and it sets it for multiplexer setting alt two, which is the UART function. And then there's also an alt zero, which is always the analog default function if there is one. And then uh, the alt one, which is GPIO, and then alt three, four, five, six, and seven if they're implemented, uh, may be other things. Generally, none of the pins have all eight possibilities uh, populated. Usually there's only at most three different things that any particular pin can be. Uh, and for any particular thing, there's only maybe two or three different choices uh, among the 80 pins. Okay, so so that's how you get the UART pin set up. And then down here, uh, now what, what's not shown here, and it's a little disturbing, I'm not sure, I've looked hard to try and find it, I cannot locate it. Um, but someplace we they also have uh, some code that configures the UART uh, baud rate and all those things, uh, that, because each UART has its own control registers, several several configuration registers and and several uh, um, information registers that display different uh, errors and other things, and somewhere those registers have to be set up, uh, but I can't find it, but it's not here. Uh, and then down here we uh, we we set up um, we do set up some of this um, and uh, so this one this one uh, sets the UART zero transmit data source select and uh, and this uh, sets the uh, receive data source select so and this sim is system integration module and uh, anyway so these are these these can these also have to be set and almost all the modules on this chip uh, have some fairly complicated setup requirements uh, they're complicated enough that you you know if, if, if this were your full-time job and all you were doing uh, was writing code for this chip you would eventually learn all this stuff and get good at it but it would probably take you six months to a year of your eight to five job every week doing nothing but writing code for this chip so I I think I think that would be a, let's see I'm gonna, 
So, so it's just important to keep in mind that it, it is complicated. And then, um, so, so then we have, uh, we have this module here, which if we click on it, we get another, we get another little screen. Oops. And if we expand this one a little bit, what this one does, this one sets up your clock module. And <coughs> so this is what actually configures the, the clock. Uh, and it's going to use this external oscillator and it's going to uh, uh, configure it so that it generates uh, uh, the clock rate that you want to use. And I believe. I believe it runs the chip at the maximum rate of uh, 48 megahertz. I believe that's what it does. Uh, and at some point, we're gonna we're gonna play with that. We'll actually uh, turn on the pin that brings the clock out so we can see it. We'll put the scope on it and measure it and see what it's actually doing. But I'm pretty sure that's what it's doing here. And um, all these all these uh, these keywords that are used are are basically part. Uh, they're they're included in the uh, in one of the header files for the uh, for the uh, KL25Z uh, 128 VOK4 uh, chip, and so you can you can also pull up and look at that file, but I don't think we'll do that now. It's a little too complicated. And then um, and then uh, the same thing applies to the debug console. There's some additional uh, things that get done here. What's nice is on all these all these things you can um, you can actually you see what what this code is doing. You can actually look at the actual code, and you can see here, it, it does this clock setup, uh, 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 low power um, SCI zero clock, and then it's one. That's the setting, and one is this uh, internal uh, the IRC forty eight megahertz. So that's what you're actually selecting here. You're you're setting that clock at forty eight megahertz, and I believe. I, I don't think it, I, I don't think it's using the internal oscillator. I think it is using that external oscillator, but I could be wrong about that. So anyway, that's going to take a little more digging around and figuring out. And that's what I want you to do. I want you to really get into this chip and and play with these things. Look at this stuff and see if you can see if you can figure out you know what's going on and how this is actually working. And then we do this printf statement. Then in the infinite while loop, notice here this is what's in the infinite while loop. And notice uh, we have uh, ch equals get character and then put put character and we give it ch we could have actually put get character in this parentheses and, and just had this in one line uh, all this does the get character is a routine that reads and here it is let's see I think it, well, it came up again and uh, it's just a macro, and you can blow this up. Uh, although it looks like that's almost all of it there. So, yeah, there we go. And that's what it does. It it changes this into this statement here. And so you have to go down, and uh, I haven't actually looked at this before, but uh, this looks kind of complicated. So I'm not really sure what it's doing. Um, you know what this does. I haven't played with this either. I see. So you can see different things. All right. Well, anyway, uh, so you can you can expand any of these, which is kind of nice. And generally, uh, it, in the pick, what this get character routine. If you remember from the pick, we had to write our own get character routine, and all it did was write to the uh, to the transmit register, or, or actually read from the read register of, uh, in this one. In this case, uh, from the read register. Uh, for the input register of the uh, of the UART, I guess the receive register, and then this one just wrote to the transmit register, and that's how that worked. Uh, but you could have had it uh, you could have had it uh, set up as an I squared C routine using that. You could have had it set up as an SPI routine using it in some kind of SPI channel to send something somewhere. Uh, you could have had it a uh, driving you know uh, a parallel port with eight bits. Uh, so you can write your own get character routine, and then printf uses put character and get character to do its work. So 
So that allows you to sort of direct the output wherever you want it to go. And anyway, so that's how that's set up. Um, okay, so, um, so when you actually run this routine, you use the little blue bug up here. And I hope you can see that. I know it's, it's small. Uh, and when you do that, then it's gonna, it's gonna, you're, you're gonna see down here under the console, it's gonna do a bunch of stuff. If you have everything set up right, the first time you do this, you have to pick what programmer you want. And uh, unfortunately, I don't know how to get back to that uh, at this point. Um, uh, let's see, this kind of launch is configured to open uh, the development perspective when it suspends. Let you work on your embedded code and debug it using. Uh, do you want to switch this perspective now? Yeah. So, what happens then is it switches from this perspective, which is basically where you write your code, to the debug perspective. And you'll see the screen change. And now you will have some different windows. Uh, and we can set up variables in this window to look at, uh, or maybe down here. And we can have the console window here. And we still see our various programs here and our. Uh, in our control panel down here, our quick start panel down here. Uh, so it only changes it somewhat. And if you want to go back to that other perspective, you can go up there and click that. That puts you back to where you were. But if you want to go into the development, you can go here. So uh, it gives you several different perspectives. And I think this is the debug perspective here, where you actually have a list of variables and some other stuff here. And you have. Uh, you can look at your different registers. Remember, there are 13 general purpose registers in this chip, and it lets you look at all of them, which is kind of cool. Uh, so, but we'll go to here, which is the development right, the development view. Okay, so now uh, you actually have to punch the green arrow to run the code. This green arrow is fine. This green arrow is fine. I don't know why they reproduce the green arrows, but anyway. We'll punch this one, and uh, let's see. It didn't do something right. Let's try this again. So I'm going to hit the red square. That takes me back here, and then I'm just going to go ahead and hit the, the blue debug again. Yeah, so it... It built without any errors. I think it should be working. Okay, and then let's let's hit this arrow. Yeah, I, I okay. So for some reason it didn't like this arrow. You have to hit this arrow. Don't ask me why. Uh, hopefully we'll slowly but surely understand all these things. And then uh, then it prints out hello world, which is what we want to do. And then uh, down here, if I type a character, it should echo the character. So if I type F, G, H, J, K, L. Now normally, if you didn't have this put character line here, so if I comment this out um, like this, then, and I redo it, I'm still sending the character to the uh, KL25Z, but you're not gonna see it because there's no echo. And and then we'll run it. There's Hello World. And now if I go down here and type characters A, S, D, E, well, look at that. So it does still, it shows them. Huh, that is interesting. Didn't really need, it didn't need to echo them. Hmm. Well, go figure. Huh. All right, well, sometimes, sometimes things are confusing. I, I guess, I guess it actually, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, then we should have seen, I would have thought we would have seen him twice with the put character. Let me just do this. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to copy this. And now I want to see what actually does happen. Okay, we'll do it again. Save the code. So this is, uh, I'm doing this because I want to model for you the behavior I'd like you guys to adopt. 
You need to be curious. Uh, you can't screw anything up. Just just play with it and, and see why it didn't work the way we thought it should. Now, I'm expecting to see, if I type an S, I'm expecting to see two S's. Nope. So in that, so, yeah, so, I, so one of the things that I did, and I'm still a little confused about this, but I'm going to mess with it here. So if I go into Device Manager and I find out what port we're actually on, and I look on the COM ports, here we are. So we're on COM3. All right, that's great. So now I'm going to shrink this down. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and uh, hit PuTTY. And I'm going to go ahead and bring up a serial port for COM3. I want to see what happens here. I've actually done this before. Now I have to, the baud rate here is 115200. But the rest of the things should be set up OK. And I guess you could uh, screw with them. But anyway, uh, all right. And so now we can bring this in. Well, we may not be able to. Let me, let me shrink this down. Put this over here. And actually put myself back in. Now, uh, now let's see what happens if we hit, uh, let's see what happens if we hit an S here. Nothing. Let's see what happens if we hit like an A here. So, yeah, so for some reason it does not, this, this, this terminal window, Putty's happy to put this terminal window up and it thinks it's working, but for some reason it's not seeing, it's not displaying the information that's flowing through that uh, port. So I don't understand that. And uh, maybe my terminal program. Um, so I don't really know. Yeah, I don't really understand that. And it has, it is uh, 115, 8 bits, 1 data bit, no parity. I don't know about the X on, X off. Let's see, uh, let's go back to that. Um, Read me. See what they actually said you had to have. No flow control. Okay, so maybe that's it. X on, X off is causing the problem. All right, so let me get out of it. Try it one more time, and then I'll, I, I know it's a little bit distracting to you all. Um, all right, so I want to get, uh, I want to do serial. I don't want to do 115, 200, which is basically the maximum baud rate. And then I do want to do uh, keyboard features. I don't see it there. System, window appearance, correction, data proxy, serial. Yeah, so I want flow control, none. All right, let's see what happens now. Uh, hmm. Oh, I didn't pick the right port. I think I screwed up. Let's do this again. It was, it was three, right? Where is it? Where's my thing? Three, yeah. Uh, okay, 115.2. And serial. None. Okay, now let's see if we can do this. Now let's see. I don't. I don't. I'm not. I don't know that it's going to work. But it's gonna, we're going to see. All right. Let's put them back down here. Nope. All right. Well, that wasn't the problem. So who knows? All right. So anyway, uh, so that gives you a little bit of idea of how I want you to think about these labs. Uh, I want you to play with them. I want you to look at the code. I want you to really, because we're going to use these demo programs. Um, and, and then as we go on, we'll start with some of these. We'll configure some of these devices. Like in this case, uh, we already have the, uh, we already have the, the UART's already configured for us. So we could do some other things. So for instance, we could put, we could do a printf statement down here if we wanted. And we could, uh, We could just, we could, we could, uh, so let's see, I should be able to click a thing and make all these commented out. I uh, don't see it. Oh, anyway, we just do this. We just, so first of all, I'll delete this one. And then I'll just put, you know what, totally destroy my code. 
and but what then I will do instead is we'll, we'll put this in and then instead of hello world we'll do uh, all right now let's let's run this oh well I don't know how I got this screen I guess because I clicked it twice so this, if you're having trouble, supported probes. Uh, so you have to you have to go in here and you have to you have to tick this one. And when you do, uh, it it'll uh, it'll it'll pull up this open SDA, and you have to highlight the open SDA and hit OK. And that's how you connect to your target. And. Oh, okay, didn't like that because there's a running debug session. So I'm going to kill this. Kill this. And then now I should be able to do the blue thing. And it should be okay. Well, maybe not. Okay, so let's go back to here. So we do have that one loaded up. So make sure it's highlighted, I guess. Okay, and then it's, it's asking for that. And then I am plugged in, so that should be okay. So if you get that screen, uh, yeah, switch. And we want to switch to the different perspective. That's fine. All right, now it's ready to run. And so, yeah, so it works like we think it should there. Mm -hmm. And then just for grins, I'm going to see. I'm a little curious, but. Cop three, one, one. All right, so anyway, uh, so we're going to stop it. Okay, so I think I'm going to leave this. There are, of course, a lot of other features. This week, the lab we're going to do, so this was last week's, and uh, I guess I should clean this up before I exit it. So I'll delete my thing here, and then I'll take these out. Okay. And then I'll do it one more time so it'll save it. Okay. All right. So I'm still going to I'm going to go over here and I'm going to select this and I'm going to close the project. I'll go ahead and stop the debug session. Okay. Now the one we're going to do this week uh, is we're going to do the, I think we're going to do the bubble level. And so I'm going to open the project. And uh, then I'll expand it. And I'll look at, so I'll look down here at the dot. And I may have to go back to this perspective. Let's see, I don't need this. Okay. Yeah, I know my mouse is locked up. Okay, there we go. Find it. Okay, so I'm, I'm in the right perspective, I'm in this perspective. And then we should be able to see this. There it is. So here's the, so it works like a little bubble level. Again, it tells you the same stuff about setting up a terminal window, which we just found didn't work with Hello World, and it, I don't believe it works with this one either. Uh, you'll see in the monitor though, you will see the uh, you'll see these x and y values change, 
Uh, all right, so anyway, uh, so we'll do this and we will um, compile it. Okay, so now we just have to run it. Now, I think what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna shrink this down again and we'll, we'll switch me back to the board so you can see that. And maybe we'll just go ahead and add me to the camera. Okay, so this one just doesn't shrink. It has a lot of border on it that's kind of a pain in the butt. All right, nope. Okay, so now you can see when we run it, uh, so first off, you'll see it put the X, Y values over here, and then over here, it'll use the LED as we tilt it, it gets green in the, in the uh, Y direction, and in the X direction, it gets red, and if we tilt it uh, in the other direction, it gets orange. All right. But if you've got it totally flat, then the LED goes out, more or less. You can see it's not totally flat, uh, but then when we, can, we can make teeny tiny adjustments and try and get it close to zero. And then this way. So anyhow, yeah, so we could, you could put a, you put this on your one side get it very close to zero, and then we could put um, a card under the other side. Let's see if we do this. Uh, if that makes it worse and better. Yeah, I don't know. Well, yeah, so maybe. Maybe something like this. Not quite. Well, anyway, but you get the idea. Uh, so that's what it should look like. And th and again, this has the same uh, type of thing. You there's a lot of things you can go in and look at in the code, and I really encourage you to do that. Uh, you should you should definitely read through it. This is the debug, so that's not what we really want. We want this one. Uh, bubble, yeah. So it's a little more complicated. And what you can see in here, uh, first off, you can see that it uses, uh, it talks to the accelerometer using an I2C channel. And so we're, I'll, I'll, when, I do the, when I do the lab write-up, I'm gonna hopefully go through and look at some of this. I do know, as a matter of fact, that the, I, the I2C module for this KL25Z chip is really complicated. Um, but, uh, so, but there's some, but there's, but I'll try and break it down as much as I can, and I'll put that in the lab guide. And and I'm going to want you to go through and look at this too. Um, it has it has things like um, it has things like this I2C release bus delay. <laughs> there's just a lot of things. Uh, so uh, I mean, there are a lot of features that we didn't even begin to think about on the uh, on the on the, the pic 16 f 1829 uh, itc module which uh, it, which works fine it's a pretty robust module um, but it's not nearly as complicated as this one uh, and the additional complications make it a whole lot easier a whole lot harder to get it to to the program but it but it, uh, if used properly it it should make it a lot more robust okay so I think I'm gonna, gonna go back down here and switch this camera back. And then I'm gonna pop this up. Okay, so I did wanna cover those things. Uh, so we're about 54 minutes in. Hopefully you haven't gotten too, uh, um, I don't know, too bored. Uh, the, uh, so I did want to talk a little bit about the syllabus. Uh, so let me just do that and I'll see if I can um, shrink myself back down again and 
then bring up the syllabus. Let's see, not that one. It's it's oh, I tried to put it up twice. Here. So if we go down here, um, so so first off, they the university created this really fancy prototype. Uh, but uh, I, I, I've tried to fix these, uh, these bookmarks. It's, it's confusing. And, I, uh, and then there, this is in Adobe, of course. They also work in Word. And, uh, and they're screwed up in Word. And then when they're screwed up in Word and you copy it to Adobe, they're screwed up in Adobe. So I've tried to fix them in Word. And I, I've really pulled my hair out with that. So forget the bookmarks. You just have to scroll down. You can you can read through this stuff. Uh, uh, many of these should be very similar now. Um, so we'll, so the the way the class is arranged, it's a uh, uh, one 75 minute lecture per week. Well, that's what this is, and then uh, a two and a half hour lab session per week. That's how the course is organized um, in the in the catalog. Um, so we have a few. Uh, Learning objectives, learning objectives, and then uh, so here's sort of the grading scheme. So we'll do some. Uh, I will do a post video quiz. Uh, the I guess there won't be 15 of them because uh, we didn't do one last week, and so we'll miss. There'll probably be 10 of them, uh, and we'll count maybe a half a point each. So that's that's five points. Actually, maybe I'll count 0.6 points each. So if you do them all, you get a little extra credit. Uh, there'll be a final project that will count for 20 course points. The, the labs will count for 25 course points. The homework for 12. So make sure you do the homework uh, because that'll cost you 12 course points, and that, that if you know that's enough to cause problems. Uh, and then there'll be uh, I said two midterm exams. I may not do that. I may just do one. But right now I'm planning on two for seven points each, or 14 course points, and one final for 24. And that'll give a hundred. Uh, I may change that. I'm thinking about uh, I'm thinking about l making all three of these exactly equal, and then uh, letting you drop one, uh, so that you only have to have two two decent exams or something, so you can skip the final if you did okay on the on the midterms. Um, so I may do that. So I don't know. Anyway, uh, the final won't be none of these exams will be. Um, you know, too crazy. Uh, if you've just done the labs, you should be in good shape. And watch the lectures done the labs, you should be fine. Um, and we'll do something like this. Although generally in this course, most most people, it's very rare to get a C unless you just didn't do the work. If you don't do the, if you if you miss more than one lab or you don't do the final project, uh, then you'll either get an F or an incomplete. So, um, so you pretty much need to do, you need to do those. Because that's that's how you learn in the course, and we'll talk about the final project. Uh, for those that are in uh, San Antonio, the final project will be the, the tilt table, um, and uh, you can. Uh, I already mentioned in the in the when I did the uh, the talk on last Tuesday on Zoom that uh, I'd like you to go ahead and and some students have already sent me a list of their team, so go ahead and and get a little team together of uh, three or four or five or even six students if you want. And uh, then I'll sign out a tilt table to you. Uh, we'll probably start working on the tilt tables in a in a few more weeks while we're doing uh, some of these demo programs in the lab. But then we'll switch to the tilt table. And uh, I definitely want you to, uh, if you do live anywhere near San Antonio, I'd like you to farm on one of these small teams and and participate in the tilt table. Uh, you don't have to come to lab, although the lab will be available. Uh, and uh, if I base it on my experience last semester with Micro One and DSD, we had maybe an average of three or four students in the lab. So it was pretty safe. Everybody wore a mask, plenty of social distancing because the lab's a good sized room. And uh, I, I don't think there's much risk. You probably are, are at equal risk or greater by going shopping at HEB. Uh, so uh, if you go shopping at HEB, you really should be able to come to lab. Um, 
I have had COVID and uh, I have tested uh, tested positive multiple times. And then finally, as my numbers went down, 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 or actually they go up, up, up as you get less virus uh, because it's replication. Uh, it's how many, how many doublings you have to do to detect anything. Uh, and when you get to 40 doublings, if they don't detect anything by 40 doublings, then, um, then you're considered negative. And uh, so finally I went to negative. Um, and that was, uh, I started that before Christmas and I'm five weeks out or so now. And uh, so I think I'm uh, not shedding any virus. And uh, in addition to that, uh, I should be protected from getting it again for at least five or six months. So I should be completely safe, um, but I'll still wear a mask. But I don't think I can give it to you, and I don't think you can give it to me. So, um, so I think that's that's good. Um, all right. Uh, so it probably do at least. Uh, I don't think we'll, we'll probably do uh, maybe uh, thirteen, or fourteen, fourteen or thirteen uh, post video quizzes. Uh, I'll do one for today. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, you can read through this. A lot of this is just copied straight over from the other courses. And, and this is the boilerplate the university provided. And they even threw in the, the Roadrunner crest, which was nice. Um, and so anyway, here's, here's the schedule. But this is, there's a lot of to be determined stuff on here. There's a lot of stuff that I, I will change. I didn't even write it in for lab three. Uh, lab two, we're going to do the bubble demo lab. Uh, lab three, I haven't figured out what I'm going to do for that yet. So this is going to be a work in progress. But once we get past spring break, we're just going to concentrate on the final project. And uh, uh, we're going to we're going to learn some things with the tilt table. Even if you're not doing the tilt table, I'm still going to go through this because uh, there's a lot to be learned on the tilt table. And uh, we're going to do some linear algebra and show you how to scale. Uh, uh, to change the translation errors, the rotation errors, and the scaling error, or the scaling issue. It's not so much an error, but we have to scale the, the, the touch panel to, uh, if we want to use, uh, you know, uh, plus and minus one, then we have to scale it to that uh, instead of some raw number. Um, and so we'll talk about that. We'll show how we can use linear algebra to do this. We'll actually take uh, test points off your touch panel. We'll plug those into uh, uh, into uh, uh, into uh, um, uh, the uh, um, uh, 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 in the MATLAB and uh, we'll show you how to do the linear algebra to calculate uh, uh, correction factors that then uh, you can just raw you can just take the raw data and multiply it. and uh, and that's that works really well uh, we'll show you how to set up a PID controller we'll talk about that at, at, at modest level of detail we're not going to go crazy it's not a control course but I do want you to understand uh, what your software needs to do and then once we get uh, once we get that done, then we'll hopefully walk you through the software. We'll have you write uh, write in your own PID controller, and then we'll have you tune it and get your table working so that it's uh, uh, nice. Uh, <clears throat> so, and we'll start that uh, from spring break on, and and we'll do that all through the rest of March, all April, and um, I think you know that you'll. Uh, I'll, we'll, I'll provide the guidance for that, but you guys will work in teams to get your tilt table cranking. Um, before spring break, we might do a little bit of uh, work on the tilt tables, but it'll be uh, it'll be hooking up the new boards. Uh, I may I have a I have a student that's going to do that as part of an independent study project, and and I'm going to be working on them. So, but there may be a little bit left for you to do. We'll see. Uh, but in any event, hopefully by spring break we'll have all the tilt tables ready to go. Uh, ready to rock and roll. Although we really only have um, one week of January and four weeks of February and one week of March before spring break now. So about about six weeks. Okay. Um, and uh, but we'll, we'll we'll do some of these uh, and on some of these uh, demo programs I will have uh, parts for you to write and change um, and maybe even some little uh, and then we will have questions about 
uh, how various things get get set up on those. So we'll see. So I'm 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 optimistic that this is this is going to be pretty good. Um, I want to see this. Um, I, I'm I'm optimistic that you're gonna that hopefully you're gonna enjoy this and you're gonna learn a fair amount about this processor. This is a the the uh, the KL twenty five Z does use an ARM M zero plus core. This is a very very popular uh, core, and it's in it's used in a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so that's kind of nice. And uh, and the M zero plus core uh, is only only somewhat different than than the uh, than the the M ones and M two fours and sixes. And uh, maybe even they're up to sevens and eights by this time. I don't even know. Uh, so this is a very common core. It's one of the most efficient, uh, low power cores out there, and uh, that's why most manufacturers have given up trying to do their own cores, and they've just flat out adopted this one. It also has the advantage that uh, there's all sorts of uh, third party compilers, and uh, as they say, there's an entire ecosystem around the M series that's available. Uh, to be used with this chip, so it gives you lots of uh, lots of options, and that's really nice. Um, okay, so I'm I'm thinking that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. Um, I will try. I, fr I I didn't do my office time this Monday. I don't know. I just totally missed it. Uh, but I will. I definitely will be faithful to do it every Monday as, uh, from here on out. Um, uh, and I'll write big notes for myself to remind me to do that. Um, I will be in lab on Thursday. On Friday, we have the micro lab, and we're not going to. And, and none of the lab sessions are we going to start at 8:30. I think we'll start at. Uh, I think we'll start at really more like 9:30 or even 10, uh, because there won't be that many people there, and you can work through the noon hour or whatever. If that's a problem, let me know. We'll, we'll make some adjustments. Uh, I would love it if, if if we had to start the lab at 8:30 and, and everybody came and it was crowded you know mod, well not, not crowded but we had 14 students which is our maximum capacity uh, I would love it in fact if that were the case we'd expand to the downstairs lab and we'd we'd have it available for as many you know for for 28 students 14 upstairs 14 downstairs and I'd split me and the TA and we would we'd work it uh, I would love that um, I don't even think there are 28 students assigned to any of the labs actually. But, but I know from past experience that's not likely to happen. So uh, I think you can safely assume that if you want to come to lab, there'll be plenty of space and you can just roll in. There won't be that many students there and you'll be safe. And again, if it, got, if it gets a little tight, we'll just, uh, there's nothing going on in the second floor lab on Thursdays. We'll just take over the second floor lab. On Friday, I know one of the lab sessions is on Friday morning, but on Friday we, we do have the Micro One lab as well. And so I generally will prioritize that. So again, because there's not that many students in lab, if you want to come and work upstairs on Friday, you can come and I'll open the lab up and you can work, you can work up there all day if you want, um, till three anyway. Um, so feel free to do that. Uh, but I but and I'll be able to I'll be available downstairs. So will the TA because the TA is the same for both courses. But uh, we can't be in two places at once, so so there generally won't be somebody upstairs in the third floor lab on Friday morning. Um, so right now on Thursdays, plan on plan on the lab being available from uh, 10 to 3, and we'll take an hour out for lunch from uh, 12 to 1. So if you need to, if you if you need, if you want to come to lab, come in. You can work through lunch if you want, but uh, I, but I'll probably take off and get a little lunch. Uh, the TA will probably take off and get a little lunch. And I think on one of the days, the TA's got a, on Friday, I think the TA's got a course somewhere. Uh, maybe on Thursday, he has a course uh, in the afternoon from from uh, 1 to 2 or something like that. So uh, so feel free. If you if you need some additional accommodations, let me know. Uh, we'll, we'll try and make that work. Uh, basically, there's no competition for space this semester because nobody's on campus. And I don't know if you've been to campus, but literally, I park my car, I walk from my car uh, to the engineering building, uh, to BSC, I walk through BSC to the engineering building, and I generally don't see anybody. Even outside, there are no students walking around. There might be some teenager going to take their violin lesson at the music building, and that's about it. Uh, and not even that all the time. Uh, so uh, I just, you know, it's pretty safe. 
It's like a ghost town, which is a pretty significant waste of resources in my view, but that's where we are. And maybe that's the best choice, I don't know. But in any event, um, so feel free, uh, come to lab if you want. You, you will be safe and you will be welcome. And I think you'll get help. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you're comfortable doing it at home and you feel like you're learning stuff at home, fine, that's great too. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, with the tilt tables, there will need to be a little bit of interaction with the lab, but I, I'm perfectly happy uh, for you to take the tilt tables home and work on them there. The only thing I ask, uh, the tilt tables are basically, you know, we made them from scratch, except for uh, the, uh, and, we, and the servos are fairly cheap, and, the, and all the other stuff's fairly cheap. The only thing that's a little bit tricky is the touch panel. I can't replace the touch panel. So uh, I think I have one spare. Maybe I'm not even, I'm not even sure I have one. I think we've used them all. Uh, but uh, but I, if we break one, I, then we'll have to change it out to a different touch panel. And you'll have to recalibrate the new panel, and we'll have to have a new way to hook it up because it won't be able to use the same interface. Uh, but I, we made that provision on the board, so I think it'll be, it'll be doable, uh, but it, it'll be a little bit of a hassle. So the reason the touch panels are tricky is because uh, you, we really can't, we can't really bolt them down because you can't put any pressure on the top of the touch panel without creating a touch. So we have to use the very edges, and we've used tape in the past, but the tape comes loose, and then somebody picks it up, and the panel slides off, goes to the floor and breaks, or because uh, it's glass, or, or just rips off the, the, the attaching uh, uh, flexible cable, and it, it, it just tears it off, uh, and that also renders it worthless. So, so if there's any, you know, so just be really, really careful with the touch panel. Try not to drop them, break them, drop anything on them. As long as you don't tear up the touch panel, everything else is totally fixable. If you tear up the touch panel, it's going to be a little bit of a hassle. Uh, but even that's okay. Uh, I, you know, we're not going to we're not going to blow a gasket or anything. We'll deal with it. Uh, but I just I just want you to try and try and be really careful. And and students had, were pretty careful. Uh, we didn't really tear up any of them last spring because we didn't use them. But the spring before, uh, I think we, I think we, uh, we hit one with a soldering iron, and it melted the the little ribbon cable. Uh, that was sad. Uh, and then one fell off and ripped, and uh, that was sad. So we, we killed two of them. Uh, but we had replacements for those. But I think I've used all the replacements now. The semester before that. We, we busted a bunch of them because people were not very careful. Um, okay, with that, I'm, I'm going to stop this video, and we will, um, I'll post it, and then I'll do a little quiz. Uh, and then next week, I'll, I'll try and be a little more focused. Hopefully, I'll have the lab uh, exactly what I want to do with the lab a little better worked out. And uh, just bear in mind, I'm, I'm learning this IDE along with you. Uh, you know, normally, I've done these done these things multiple times and I'm pretty pretty uh, up to speed on but on this one I, I'm learning the IDE with you it's it's new to me I really loaded it up in uh, mid to late December and I just had a few weeks to play with it and so I'm still learning it but it, I, so far I'm pretty happy I think it's 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 got some really great features to it that I think you're gonna uh, enjoy and learn a lot from all right Hopefully it'll be a great course. We will uh, we'll see you in lab or in lecture next week.